the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm Rick Beckham, the ministry coordinator here at the Trent Lakes Adventist Church. On behalf of the pastors, Deborah and Gary, our staff, the congregation, we welcome you to today's service. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I hope that you and your family or you and your friends are um, enjoying, will, will enjoy this online worship like always. We come together and worship during Lent to think of Jesus, our God, and just the blessings that we have in our daily life, in the life of others. We welcome you to worship, and as always, we begin with song. And now our call to worship. From the east and the west, from the north and the south, we come to dwell in God's steadfast love. God's love heals, forgives, and welcomes all. Receive God's gift of abundant life with open hearts and open hands as we worship, and then go forth to serve. And join me in the opening prayer. Too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down, God, to the suffering of victims, the wounds we inflict on others, and the wounds we inflict on ourselves. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to the cross that casts its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, so our hearts may be filled with faith, hope, and love. Amen. This story of all ages. Um, thinking of Lent and kind of some of the things I did in the past, how we often would give up things. I don't know, but this fable from, you know, this book that I enjoy so often, have shared with you, Fables by Arnold Lobo. This fable about a pig in the candy store came to mind. I often would give up candy or chocolate for the season of Lent. 
Uh, I don't do that anymore. Being 60, I figured I don't have to do that anymore. Actually, I'm beyond 60. But anyway, I hope that we can tie thinking of Jesus during um, this Lent and this Lentil season, and also just kind of how we don't really have to give up things. We can just do things, or we can just um, we can just kind of. Uh, well, let me just share this story, and uh, I think a fable, and let's see how it touches your heart. The pig at the candy store. All night long, a sleeping pig dreamed of candy. Can you relate? He sprouted wings of spun sugar. He flew up in a marshmallow clouds to a glowing moon. The stars that twinkled in the sky were chocolate kisses wrapped in shiny foil. Oh, the pig woke up with his mouth watering. Candy, he cried. I must have some this minute. But remember of thinking we gave, we were giving that up for Lent, kind of suffering as Jesus did? Candy, I must have some this minute. The pig ran to the candy dish. It was empty. The box of chocolate creams in the cupboard contained nothing but the paper wrappers. I know. I will go to the store, said the pig, as he put on his clothes and rushed out of the house. Well, well wait, on second thought, said the pig. I must remember, in my case, that I gave up candy, but in his case, that he remembered that candy's bad for him. It makes him fatter than he already is and it gives him gas and heartburn. Then the pig remembered his sweet dreams. He decided, as long as he was already halfway to the store, he might as well finish his journey. You know, just a few peppermints would not hurt me. It would not hurt, he said. As the pig came near the store, his mouth began to water again. Maybe I'll buy a small bag of gumdrops as well. As he arrived at the candy store, he noticed that it was closed. A sign said, on vacation. The pig went back home. What wonderful willpower I have, he cried happily. I did not eat a single piece of candy. Just like I did not do that in past kind of thinking. Anyway, what willpower. That night, the pig had a vegetable salad for supper. He drank a glass of cold, fresh milk. He felt thin and neither had gas nor heartburn. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to give up things, but when we do this, we do think of Jesus and the suffering he did for us. The fable ends with this moral. A locked door is very likely to discourage temptation. Blessings. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee, take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow. Take my voice.
Welcome back to another in our series of Claim the Promise during this Lent. It is a bright, beautiful day. Snow is melting. We have received good word in terms of COVID vaccinations. <laughs> it seems so much better than we have experienced for many, many months. Today, we're looking at a grumbly time in our Old Testament history when the people of, uh, that were Israelites were traveling through the wilderness to get to the Promised Land and nothing is going well for them. There are snakes and there's pestilence and it's very, very difficult. And so they've gone to Moses to say, would you talk with God and see what God can do? I'm reading from the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers beginning with the fourth uh, verse. They traveled from Mount Horg along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom but the people grew impatient on the way and they spoke against God and against Moses and they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a tall pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. And then we turn to the book of John, the third chapter, from which we get this marvelous um, miniature and gospel, a gospel in miniature, I should say. And it takes us to uh, the 14th verse through the 17th verse. It also refers back to the story that we've just read. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Here ends a reading from God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of these, your children, be found in your view acceptable. For, O oh Lord, you are the rock and you are the redeemer. Amen. A little girl asked her mother an age-old question, what is God like? And her mother hesitated. Why don't you go ask your dad, she said. Dad also hesitated. And many years later, when the girl was leaving uh, the house to launch her own career, her parents found a scrap of paper in the wee little corner of the bedroom that she had left. It obviously had fallen out of a moving box. The paper read, I asked my mother what God was like. She didn't know. Then I asked my father, who knows more than anyone else in all of the world, what God was like. He also did not know. I think if I had lived as long as my father and mother, I would know something about God. So this morning I ask you, how might you respond to a little girl's question? Or maybe you've been asked this by someone else. Who is God to you? Well, Nicodemus was an old, much respected, highly honored leader of the Jewish people. He knew the law. What did he know about God? One might expect that one so respected, so old, so studied in the law, so acquainted in the ways of the Torah, might know God well. And yet one night, under cover of darkness, Nicodemus sought Jesus. Now no entrapment was intended for the night. Like so many of us, what drove Nicodemus was an opportunity to learn from a young 
man who was obviously a teacher with miraculous powers. What might he learn that he had not learned from his scrolls or learned colleagues in the temple? It is apparent that Nicodemus found Jesus to be unique. He called Jesus rabbi, acknowledging that Jesus was a teacher come from God, and Jesus did not respond in any way, any overt way to those acknowledgements. Instead, what Jesus did do was to combine a traditional image of the kingdom of God with a new metaphor. As he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Astonishing Nicodemus even further, Jesus alludes to a story known by every Jew. Described in the book of Numbers, Jesus refers to this story in one way, as one way of explaining what he, Jesus, was on earth to do. It goes back to the story with snakes and poison and grumbling people. It could just as easily have been grumbling people and a pandemic. What could be so uplifting about a story of a snake on a stick? Why a snake of all things? The event took Nicodemus back to the earliest days of the Exodus experience when the former Egypt, the Egyptian slaves were wandering. They wanted to claim God's promises, but their grumbling over food and poisonous snakes was getting in the way. And so Moses talked with God. Moses was told to create a bronze image of a snake and put it on a pole and have it carried at the very beginning of this entourage of former slaves going through the desert. The theory was that as long as the Jews kept their eyes on the prize, on that creation of a bronze snake, that they would be less concerned about the poisonous snakes. And if the poisonous snakes bit them, they would be healed and lived. In addition, however, the undergirding thing of this whole story is that they were learning to depend upon the guidance of God, something they very much needed to do. Now, God could have removed the snakes and the poison, but God did neither. Just as God hasn't removed many of the problems surrounding us in the last several months, God did remind them and reminds us in the Old Testament that as we go through high water and fire, floods, other issues, God remains with us to sustain us. In this case, God gave them a remedy. What those wandering in the desert needed was to look up and live. So Jesus challenged Nicodemus to look up and live, and Jesus challenges us to do that as well. Today, Jesus might say to us, let's go, get rid of your need to control. Let go of the belief that you can build a more vibrant community by shaping it along the lines of your own preferences. preferences. Grab hold of the spirit and be born into a new way of seeing. Let go of what was, grab on where God is telling you to go, who God is asking you to be. For just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Find your meaning in life, in the love of the Creator who stands ready to fill you with new vision. This Nick at Night story is a rich story, marked by wordplay, misunderstanding, irony, and godly seriousness. We do not know if Nicodemus let go of what he previously understood, but John's Gospel says Jesus provided Nicodemus that evening with a message that was foreshadowing things to come. And he told him it isn't about a snake on a stick. It is about a Savior on a cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that all who believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. There it is, what theologians have called the gospel in miniature. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, how can you be a leader of faith and not get this? 
Want to be saved? Claim the promises of God. Theologian Thomas Merton reminds us that before we were born, God knew us and loved us intimately. God knew that some of us would rebel against love and mercy, and others would love him from the moment they could love anything and never discard that love. God knew that there would be joy in heaven among the angels of his house when some of us began to accept God's love. So was there joy among the angels in heaven as Nicodemus left that night? Well, there is no indication that Nicodemus began to follow the Christ that night. And yet Nick shows up in the darkness again. In the afternoon darkness of a weeping world, Nicodemus gathered up the body from a horrible death, a horrible crucifixion, wrapped it in about a hundred pounds of spices, think of that, and put it in the borrowed tomb of another Pharisee whose name was Joseph. Because Nicodemus finally had the courage or the faith or the desperation to look up and live. And he was obedient to the one he may have learned to follow. Now, some of us have many encounters with the holy, living every day without making a commitment to Jesus Christ. And yet, God continues to love us. Even when we embarrass God the most, God responds in love. Bill Welsh, a pastor in Desert Springs, California, wrote of his congregation. The congregation included a child who had important seizures, very difficult seizures. And the seizures were violent, they were painful, not only for the child, but also for the parents and for those who witnessed the parents' suffering. One Sunday morning in the midst of worship, the child seized painfully. His father lifted him tenderly, carried him to the back of the sanctuary, and then rocked his child, speaking softly to him, until finally the seizure relented. There was no embarrassment, there was no frustration, only love for this hurting child. And Pastor Welsh wrote afterwards, in that moment, when I was preaching, I was preached to. I heard God speaking to my heart. God said, that's the way I love you. I'm not embarrassed to have people know you are my child. Well, friends, we're making our way through Lent to Jerusalem, where we will sit in the upper room, we will pray in Gethsemane, and we will walk to Golgotha. Once again, we will face the image of the cross. Our journey is about love and life. It is about God's love for you, love that allows you to live in the fullness that God desires for you. Claim God's promise to you. If you long ago said yes to God, reaffirm that commitment this year. And if you have not yet come to God, never claimed faith, never became a Christian on purpose, never experienced the peace that many have, do so. Claim God's promise. You will know joy, as so many throughout the years have. You will live because of God's love. Amen? Amen. A number of years ago, Gary and I first viewed a little film called The Bridge. In this morning service that we have in our sanctuary, we'll be ending our time together by looking at this little six-minute film. And those of you who are worshiping on YouTube can also see this once our service has ended. I invite you to simply um, go into uh, movies or films within YouTube and see the six minute vir virtual uh, film that tells of God's love for the world. Please watch the bridge. And then remember, for God so loved the world, that God gave the only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall be saved. Claim the promises.
In becoming one of us, God became poor so that we could receive the riches of mercy. In coming to us, God took on our death so that we could be made alive together with Christ. And so this morning, I ask that you would come to this time in our service with confessions, knowing that by grace you have been saved. Let us pray together, and then I'll invite you in the silence to pray for yourself, to confess your sins, and then to receive the assurance of pardon. Let us pray. The words we speak all too often do not show that we have you in our lives, God. We spend so much time boasting to others. They imagine that we have no need of your Savior. We grumble impatiently when you do not respond immediately to our requests, whatever they may be, but are slow, so very slow, to sing your praises. We mutter under our breath about the behavior of others around us when we could be asking them if there's some way, some way that we could serve them. It is on our journey to the cross and the tomb that you fill us with the riches of your mercy. Oh, you are steadfast love. You do so not because of anything that we've done, but because of the compassion which flows from your very essence. As we open our lives to receive your forgiveness, may we turn to you who brings us life. May we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, every step of the way. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray within ourselves for the concerns of our lives. What does the Lord require of us? Enough to send the divine hope, heart, and spirit to us. Not to condemn us, but to save us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is proof of God's love for you and for me. So having confessed your sin, truly, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us continue with the prayer that our Savior taught his people to say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please listen carefully to the joys, the concerns, and the announcements as uh, Lisa and our staff share those with you. But also be aware that every gift that you send to your congregation is very useful at this time, and you may give in a variety of ways. We pray for the pastor who follows this interim team, Pastor Kevin. We pray that his time among you, which will begin at the end of June, will be lovely and glorious and meaningful, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be preached and your mission extended throughout the world. Keep he and his ministry in your prayers this week. Please keep the following people in your prayers this week. Betty, Jan, Judy, Nancy, Mitch, Britt, and their unborn baby girl, Gail and Paul, Karen, Jane, Howard's family on his passing last week, and Vaughn and family on the unexpected passing of her sister this week. This week we celebrate with the following people. Happy birthday to Marlon, Sue, and Amy. Tonight, the Lenten book study led by Pastor Gary will be held via Zoom at 6.30 p.m. 
Tomorrow night, the church council will meet via Zoom at 6.30 p.m. The Tuesday morning Bible study group will meet at 9.15 a.m. in the fellowship hall here at the church. Tuesday evening, the SPRC will meet via Zoom at 7 p.m. Wednesday night at 6.15, we will meet in person for our TGIW worship service. Please call or email to reserve a spot if you will be coming to that service. Following worship on Wednesday night at 7 p.m., our confirmands will meet with Pastor Gary here at the church. The gentlemen will meet via Zoom on Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Please note that time change. Thursday morning, the Circle Ladies will meet here at the church in the Fellowship Hall at 9.30. Reva's Bible Study Group will meet here Thursday morning, but at 10.30 this week. And also on Thursday, the Stewardship Team meets via Zoom at 6.30 p.m. It's a busy week here at DLUMC, so if you need any clarification on any of those meeting times or dates, please be sure to check your weekly journey notes email that comes out on Thursdays. And as always, you can continue to give your offerings via mail at 885 Pembina Trail. You can drop them off with Beth in the church office Monday through Friday, or you can give online through our website at dlumc.org. Thank you. List be the toy that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred. now receive the benediction. Who are we? We are a missionary force of Christians, and what do we do? We offer the care and compassion of Christ. To whom? To all. Where do we meet you? Wherever you are on life's journey. And now go forth and bear the cross into the world, the cross that redeems the world, the cross that shares love, the cross that is the bridge to you and to all of humankind. In the name of Jesus Christ, be sent forth. Amen.